Chapter Thirteen of Jim Davis by John Macefield. This and all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen in the Valley. We turn down the valley along the coast track, splashing through the little stream that makes it so boggy at the gate, and soon we were on the coach road, galloping along the straight two miles toward Tor Cross. Our horses were beginning to give way, for we had done four miles at good speed, and now the preventives began to gain upon us. Looking back as we galloped, we could see them on the straight road, about two hundred yards away. Every time we looked back, they seemed to be a little nearer, and at last Mara leant across and told me to keep low in my saddle as he thought they were going to fire on us. A carbine shot cracked behind us, and I heard the zip of the bullet over me. A man ran out suddenly from one of the furze bushes by the road, and a voice cried, Stop them, boys! The road seemed suddenly full of people who snatched at our reins and hit us with sticks. I got a shrewd blow over the knee, and I heard Mara say something as he sent one man spinning to the ground. Crack! Crack! went the carbines behind us. Someone had hold of my horse's reins, shouting, I've got you, anyway! Then Mara fired a pistol. It all happened in a second. The bullet missed but the flash scorched my horse's nose. The horse reared and knocked the man down, and then we were clear, and rattling along toward Tor Cross. Looking back, we saw one or two men getting up from the road, and then half a dozen guns and pistols flashed, and Mara's horse screamed and staggered. There was a quarter mile yet to go to Tor Cross, and that quarter mile was done at such a speed as I have never seen since. Mara's horse took the bit in his teeth, and something of his terror was in our horses, too. In a moment, as it seemed, we were past the houses and over the rocks by the brook mouth, and there, with a groan, Mara's horse came down. Mara was evidently expecting it, for he had hold of my rein at the time, and as his horse fell, he cleared the body. Get down, Jim, he said. We're done. The horses are cooked. They have had six miles. Another mile would kill them poor beast's hearts burst. Down with you. He lifted me off the saddle and lashed the two living horses over the quarters with a strip of seaweed. He patted the dead horse, or the poor boy, and dragged me down behind one of the black rocks, which crop up there above the shingle. The two horses bolted off along the strand, scattering the pebbles, and then, while the clash of their hoofs was still loud upon the stones, the preventives came pounding up, their horses all badly blown and much distressed. Their leader was Captain Barmore. I knew him by his voice. Here's a dead horse, he cried. Sergeant, we have one of their horses. Get down and see if there's any contraband upon him. After them, you others. We shall get them now. Ride on, I tell you. What are you pulling up for? The other preventives crashed on over the shingle. Captain Barmore and the sergeant remained by the dead horse. Mara and I lay close under the rock, hardly daring to breathe, and wondering very much whether we made any visible mark to the tall man on his horse. Shots rang out from the preventive's carbines, and the gallopers made a great clash upon the stones. We heard the sergeant's saddle creak only a few yards away, and then his boots crunched on the beach as he walked up to the dead horse. No. There be no tubs here, sir, he said, after a short examination. Her be dead enough. Stone dead, sir. There's an empty pistol case, master. Oh, said Captain Barmore, any saddlebag or anything of that kind? The man fumbled about in the gear. No, there was nothing of that kind, nothing at all. Bring on the saddle, said the captain. There may be papers stitched in it. We heard the sergeant unbuckling the girth. By the way, said the captain, you're sure the third horse was led? Yes, said the sergeant. Two and a led horse there was, sir. Hmm, said the captain. I wonder if they've dismounted. They might have. Look about among the rocks there. I saw Mara's right hand raise his horse pistol as the sergeant stepped nearer. In another moment, he must have seen us if he had even looked down, he could not have failed to see us. But he stood within six feet of us, looking all around him 
looking anywhere but at his feet, and then he walked away from us and looked at the rocks near the brook. You see them? snapped the captain. No, sir, nothing of them. They beant about here, sir. I think they've ridden on. Shall I look in the furs there, sir, afore we go? No, said the captain. Well, yes, just take a squint through it. But as the sergeant waddled uneasily in his sea boots across the shingle, the carbines of the preventives cracked out in a volley about a quarter of a mile away. A shot or two followed the volley. A shotgun that last, sir, said the sergeant. Yes, said the captain. Come along. There's another. Come, mount, man. They're engaged. We heard the sergeant's horse squirming about as the sergeant tried to mount, and then the two galloped off. Voices sounded close beside us and feet moved upon the sand. Still, growled Mara in my ear. Someone cried out, Further on! They're fighting further on! Hurry up, and we shall see it! About a dozen Torcross men were hurrying up in the chance of seeing a skirmish. The wife of one of them, old Mrs. Rivers, followed after them, calling to her man to come back. I'll give it to ye if you don't come back! Come back, I tell ye! They passed on rapidly, pursued by the angry woman, while more shots banged and cracked further and further along the shore. We waited till they passed out of hearing, and then Mara got up. Come on, son, he said. We must be going. Lucky your teeth didn't chatter, or they'd have heard of us. I wish they had heard us, I cried hotly. Then I'd have gone home tonight. Let me go, Mara, let me go home. Next trip, Jim, he said kindly. Not this. I want you to learn about life. You'll get mewed up with them ladies else, and then you will never do anything. Ah, I said, but if you don't let me go, I'll scream now. Now then, I'll scream. Scream away, son, said Mara calmly. There's not many to hear you now, but you'll not get home after what you have seen tonight. Come on now. He took me by the collar and walked me swiftly to a little cove where one or two of the Torcross fishers kept their boats. I heard a gun or two away in the distance, and then a great clatter of shingle as the Coast Guard's horses trotted back toward us, with the lead horse between two of them as the prize of the night. They did not hear us and could not see us, and Mara took good care not to let me cry out to them. He just turned my face up to his and muttered, you just try it, you try it, son, and I'll hold you in the sea till you choke. The wind was blowing from the direction of the Coast Guards toward us, and even if I had cried out, perhaps they would never have heard me. You may think me a great coward to have given in in this way, but few boys of my age would have made much outcry against a man like Mara. He made the heart die within you, and to me, cold and wet from my ducking, terrified of capture in spite of my innocence, for I was not at all sure that the smugglers would not swear that I had joined them, and had helped them in their fights and escapades. The outlook seemed so hopeless and full of misery that I could do nothing. My one little moment of mutiny was gone. My one little opportunity was lost. Had I made a dash for it? But it is useless to think in that way. Mara got into the one boat which floated in the little artificial creek and thrust me down into the stern sheets. Then he shoved her off with a stretcher. The oars had been carried to the fisher's house. There were none in the boat, and as soon as we were clear of the rocks in the rather choppy sea, he stepped the stretcher in the mast crutch as a mast and hoisted the coat as a sail. He made rough sheets by tying a few yards of spun yarn to the coat skirts and then Shipping the rudder, he bore away before the wind toward the cave of Black Pool. We had not gone far, certainly not fifty yards, when we saw the horses of the Coast Guards galloping down to the sea, one of the horses shying at the whiteness of the breaking water. A voice hailed us. Boat ahoy! It shouted. What are you doing in the boat there? And then all the horsemen drew up in a clump among the rocks. Us be drifting, master shouted Mara, speaking in the broad dialect of the Devon men. Us be drifting. Come in till I have a look at you, cried the voice again. Row into the rocks here. Us a got no oars, shouted Mara, letting the boat slip on. 
Lie down, son, he said. There will fire in another minute. Indeed, we heard the ramrods and the carbines and the loud crack of the gun cocks. Boat ahoy, cried the voice again. Row in at once, do you hear? Row in all at once or I shall fire on you. Mara did not answer. Present arms, cried the voice again after a pause. And at that, Mara bowed down in the stern sheets under the gunwale. Fire, said the voice, and a volley ripped up the sea all around us, knocking off splinters from the plank and flattening out against this transom. Keep down, Jim. You're all right, said Mara. We will be out of range in another minute. Bang! came a second volley, and then single guns cracked and banged at intervals as we drew away. For the next half hour we were just within the extreme range of the carbines and musketoons. During that half hour we were slowly slipping by the long two miles of Slapton Sands. We could not go fast, for our only sail was a coat, and though the wind was pretty fresh, the set of the tide was against us, so for half an hour we crouched below that Roman's gunwale, just peeping up now and then to see the white line of the breakers on the sand, and beyond the black outlines of the horsemen, who slowly followed us, firing steadily, but with no very clear view of what they fired at. I thought that the two miles would never end. Sometimes the gun would stop for a minute, and I would think, ah, now we're out of range, or now they've given us up. And then, in another second, another volley would rattle at us, and perhaps a bullet would go winding overhead, or a heavy chewed slug would come plomb into the boat's side within six inches of me. Mar didn't seem to mind their firing. He was too pleased at having led the preventives away from the main body of the night riders to mind a few bullets. Ah, Jim, he said, there's three thousand pounds in lace, brandy, and tobacco gone to Dartmoor this night, and all them red coat fellers got was a dead horse and a horse with a water breaker on him. And the dead horse was their own, and the one they took. I stole them out of the barrack stables myself. But horse stealing is a capital offense, I cried. They they could hang you. Yes, he said, so they would if they could. Bang came another volley of bullets all around us. They'd shoot us too if they could, so far as that goes, but so far they haven't been able. Never cross any rivers till you come to the water, Jim. Let that be a lesson to you. I have often thought of it since as sound advice, and I have always tried to act upon it but at the time it didn't give much comfort. At the end of half an hour, we were clear of Slapton Sands and coming near to street, and here even Mara began to be uneasy. He was watching the horsemen on the beach very narrowly, for as soon as they had passed the lee, they had stopped firing on us and had gone at a gallop to the beach boathouse to get out a boat. "'What are they doing, Mara?' I asked. "'Getting out a boat to come after us,' he answered. "'Silly fools!' If they'd done it that at once, they'd have got us. They may do it now. There goes the boat. We heard the cries of the men as the boat ground over the shingle. Then we heard shouts and cries and saw a light in the boathouse. Looking for oars and sails, said Mara, and there are none. Good there are none. Happily for us there were none. But we heard a couple of horses go clattering up the road to O'Farrell's cottage to get them. We shall get away now, said Mara. In a few minutes we were out of sight of the beach, then one of the strange coast currents caught us and swept us along finely for a few minutes. Soon our boat was in the cave, snugly lashed to the ring bolts, and Mara had lifted me up the stairs to the room where a few smugglers lay in the hammocks, sleeping heavily. Mara made me drink something and eat some pigeon pie, and then, stripping my clothes from me, he rubbed me down with a blanket, wrapped me in a pile of blankets, and laid me to sleep in a corner on an old sail. End of chapter 13